Looking back at awesome first-person shooters from the early to mid-90s, several come to mind immediately. Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, Duke Nukem 3D, Tech War. Boy, it, no one thinks of Tech War, how'd that get in here? And one that soon comes to mind for me is Rise of the Triad, published by Apogee Software in 1995 and developed by an internal team there calling themselves the developers of Incredible Power. This was a team led by none other than ex-id software employee Tom Hall, heading a team of talented people like Joe Siegler, William Scarborough, Bobby Prince, Joseph Selinski, Stephen Hornback, and many others. There's no doubt in my mind they were devs of incredible power. Just look at this feature list. Unmatched realism, five unique characters, 30 plus levels across four episodes, online multiplayer, 20 freaking megabytes of game content, and really cool explosions. Well, why didn't you say so at first? No other game has that. Rise of the Triad was sold as shareware, like everything else from Apogee, but you could buy it in the stores in this formgen retail box. Inside this glorious package, you get the game on floppy disks or a single CD-ROM, and a manual filled with at least 20 megabytes of game content and really cool explosions. The hunt begins with some lovely logos, letting you luxuriate in the loveliness of their logo-ness. You're then gifted with the main menu's optional options, like starting a new single-player game, multiplayer game, saving and loading, the options, ordering, high scores, gameplay demos, and an amazing quit button. Honestly, this thing is fantastic. Just look at all these ways to quit! And each one of them is even accompanied by their own slightly disturbing sound effect. Starting a new game is a bit different than most FPS's, since you are given the option of five characters to play as. Each one not only has their own look and voice, but unique yet somewhat predictable characteristics. Like the big guy is slower but can take more damage, while the smaller gal can't take as much pain but is far more quick and nimble. You then get an assortment of difficulty levels, each one more cleverly worded than the last, as was often the case with shooters back then. Your journey then begins with a series of panels setting up the loose plot for your incoming homicidal experience. Basically, you're a member of the special ops team known as the High Risk United Nations Task Force, or HUNT. While doing routine surveillance near the island of San Nicolas, some patrolling douches decide to make violent love to your boat with high explosives. While stranded on the island, you learn of a terrible plot of terribleness that must be stopped. And instead of waiting around for a proper backup, you go in with guns blazing and murder the crap out of everything with really cool explosions. If you're any kind of familiar with Wolfenstein 3D, you may be getting a bit of a similar vibe here, just by the look of the weapons, some of the enemies, and level limitations, like 90 degree walls and unchanging ceiling heights in individual maps. That's because it's running on an enhanced version of the Wolf 3D engine, and actually began its life as a sequel to that game, to be titled Rise of the Triad Wolfenstein 3D Part 2. However, during development they were contacted by John Romero at id Software, saying the project had been cancelled, likely due to not wanting conflicts with their upcoming project, Doom. But since they had so much work done, Apogee kept the project going, changed around the required assets, and just went absolutely insane with the design now that they weren't restrained by the Wolfenstein brand. And what resulted is this. An absolutely wild and unique frag fest of a game that makes little to no sense when you think about anything that's going on in it, and honestly, who gives a crap? Like seriously, this game is stupid. So freaking stupid, and that is just the coolest thing if you ask me. I love it when games don't take themselves seriously at all, especially when you have such limitations with what you can do in a game engine. Just go overboard, then you don't even notice the limitations. Yeah, back then, sometimes you had to go bonkers just to make your game stand out, and Rise of the Triad is a prime example. Though at its heart, it really is a typical shooter from the mid-90s. You've got some basic controls for running, strafing, shooting, and interacting with the environment. And like Wolfenstein, Stein 3D and Doom, you don't even have a button for jumping. You pick up health items for health, then guns and ammo for guns and ammo, and of course look for keys to open doors to get to the next level that is rarely connected logically to the previous one. But beyond that, this game was practically like nothing else out there at the time. For one thing, there are the weapons in the game. You've got 11 of them here in the categories of bullet weapons, missile weapons, and magic weapons. <laughs> yes, magic weapons. So you not only get things like pistols, machine guns, and rocket launchers, but you also get things like the Excalibat, which can deal serious melee damage and shoot exploding baseballs. The Dark Staff, which fires highly charged energy spheres that explode anything in their path. And the Hand of God, which not only makes you invincible, but turns you into a freaking god, disintegrating any and all foes that dare cross you. 
And even some of the quote-unquote regular weapons have weird twists, like the firebomb that releases a devastating cross-shaped explosion, the flame wall which shoots a rocket towards the ground that proceeds to burst into a massive wall of fire that incinerates everything in its path except robots, because robots are just that freaking evil, and the drunk missile which uh, fires five heat-seeking missiles in a drunken manner that truly makes no sense. Though for some reason, you can only hold four weapons at once, with only one of them being either a missile or magic weapon. I guess this is a somewhat realistic limitation on your character, but yeah, when the rest of the game beats realism to a pulp with a magic baseball bat, what's the point? Then you've got the different pickups in the game, many of which I don't think I've seen in any other game since. In addition to normal things like health pickups and the like, you also have these collectible coin things with onks on them. They're often out of reach, so even though you can't jump, you can use jump pads to hurl yourself into them and collect them for points. If you collect enough of them, you'll earn an extra life. And yeah, you have lives in Rise of the Triad, which is kind of confusing since you can simply save your game anywhere and reload at any time, but whatever. Some people like high scores. Then you have power-ups, and these are quite unique. In addition to the previously mentioned God Mode, you also have one called Mercury Mode, which allows you to fly around the level for a limited time, letting you find all sorts of otherwise inaccessible secrets. You also have a couple power downs, like Elasto Mode, which decreases friction to the point that you're bouncing around the level like a pinball, and Shrooms Mode, which puts you under the influence of psychedelic mushrooms. I, uh... I have no idea why, but hey, the rest of the game is a bit of a trip, so why not? And lastly, you have Dog Mode, a dyslexic form of God Mode taken to its literal meaning. Dog Mode not only gives you God Mode, but turns you into a dog. Yup, run around barking and biting at enemies until you morph back into your human form, Animorph style. And it is fantastic. Seriously, why hasn't there been a full first-person shooter made with the idea of taking down bad guys as a dog? Beyond all this, it's mostly pretty standard stuff for a game of this time period and using this engine. I mean, yeah, there were some serious enhancements to the engine, like shootable windows and objects and jump pads and varying types of lighting and fog and aiming up and down and such, but it's still a Wolf 3D-based game. The levels get really complex before long, and some of them are actually up to the equivalent of one million square feet large. You'll probably be wandering around for ages on certain levels, just trying to remember which area had that one pushable wall that hid that one freaking key. And on top of all the regular navigation, you've got a plethora of secrets and easter eggs in every level, so there's certainly no shortage of content on offer here, however convoluted and overwhelming it may feel after long periods of play. Now don't get me wrong, it's way more entertaining to me than Wolfenstein 3D ever was, but it's still not as continuously playable to me as something like Doom. And I think that's got something to do with how Doom is just sort of a masterwork of just enough complexity balanced with fine-tuned gameplay. Nothing really feels extraneous in Doom, whereas in Rise of the Triad I start to tire of all the weird jumping puzzles, the bizarre key locations, the annoying power downs, and even some of the weapons, like the split missile, which, while kind of cool, just feels clunky to use. But still, the game is so chock-full of so much craziness and such cheeky personality and fine little details that just make you smile that I find it absolutely engaging every time I start it up, at least for a couple hours or so. And taking a look at its contemporaries, it just stands out from the rest with its bloody eyeballs and middle fingers flying at the screen. And that's just the single player. There was also the multiplayer mode, known as Combat, which is impressively full-featured for a deathmatch experience back then. Lots of modes to choose from, tons of maps to play in, plenty of options to enable and disable, and even the ability to customize the look of your character, at least somewhat. I never really played this mode back in the day because I didn't have a connection that allowed me to do so, much less friends that owned the game, but it's something that at least impresses me now just by how chock full of stuff it is. And the rot experience does not stop there, because there were multiple versions of the game released. We've been looking at Dark War here, which is the main full version of the game, but there were multiple versions of Dark War, some with more features or more levels, and the one you can get today on places like GOG.com and Steam are the most full featured of those, known as the site license version. But there was also a version called The Hunt Begins, which was a shareware game containing 10 levels unique to it. You also had several level packs released by other vendors and some for free online, as well as an official one known as Extreme Rise of the Triad. This was put together by two of the original developers, Tom Hall and Joe Siegler, and contained 42 more difficult new levels by them, as well as the full level editor, some user-made levels, sound files, and more. 
There was even a randomized level generator program released for the game, which, like the one for Wolfenstein's Spear of Destiny before it, allowed you to randomly generate both single-player and multiplayer levels using the set of parameters you provide it. And that's still not everything I could mention about this game, but suffice to say, I think Rise of the Triad is worth seeking out. If anything, it's worthwhile because of the revival of the series in 2013, developed by Interceptor Entertainment, and I think experiencing the game's roots helps appreciate the new one all the more. And even though I get a bit tired of the game's formula before too awful long, I still like going back and playing it every so often. So I'd say it's worth reliving if you remember it from the past, or if you have never played it but want to play a mid-90s FPS game that doesn't give a crap about anything, goes insane on you and just tosses ludicrous jibs in your face, then Rise of the Triad is definitely the game to check out.